Chapter 1 of The First Christmas Tree A Story of the Forest This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Penny Ann The First Christmas Tree A Story of the Forest by Henry Van Dyke Chapter 1 the call of the woodsman the day before christmas in the year of our lord seven twenty two broad snow meadows glistening white along the banks of the river moselle pallid hillsides blooming with mystique roses where the glow of the setting sun still lingered upon them an arch of clearest faintest azure bending overhead in the centre of the aerial landscape of the massive walls of the cloister of fazel gray to the east purple to the west silence over all a gentle eager conscious stillness diffused through the air like perfume as if the earth and sky were hushing themselves to hear the voice of the river faintly murmuring down the valley in the cloister too there was silence at the sunset hour all day long there had been a strange and joyful stir among the nuns a breeze of curiosity and excitement had swept along the corridors and through every quiet cell the elder sisters the provost the deaconess the stewardess the portress with her huge bunch of keys jangling at her girdle had been hurrying to and fro busied with household cares in the huge kitchen there was a bustle of hospitality preparation the little banty-legged dogs that kept the spits turning before the fires had been trotting steadily for an hour until their tongues hung out for want of breath the big black pots swinging from the cranes had bubbled and gurgled and shaken and sent out puffs of appetizing steam saint martha was in her element it was a field day for her virtues the younger sisters the pupils of the convent had forsaken their latin books and their embroidery frames their manuscripts and their miniatures and fluttered through the halls in little flocks like merry snowbirds all in black and white chattering and whispering together this was no day for tedious task work no day for grammar or arithmetic no day for picking out or illuminating letters in red and gold on stiff parchment or patiently chasing intricate patterns over thick cloth with a slow needle it was a holiday a famous visitor had come to the convent it was wilfred of england whose name in the roman tongue was boniface and whom men called the apostle of germany a great preacher a wonderful scholar he had written a latin grammar himself think of it and he could hardly sleep without a book under his pillow but more than all a great and daring traveller a venturesome pilgrim a high priest of romance he had left his home and his fair estate in wessex he would not stay in the rich monastery of nutsell even though they had chosen him as the abbot he had refused the bishopric at the court of king carl nothing would contend him but to go into the wild woods and preach to the heathen up and down through the forest of hesse and thuringia and along the borders of saxony he had wandered for years with a handful of companions sleeping under the trees crossing the mountains and marshes now here now there never satisfied with ease and comfort always in love with hardship and danger what a man he was fair and slight but straight as a spear and strong as an oaken staff his face was still young his smooth skin was bronzed by wind and sun his gray eyes clear and kind flashed like fire when he spoke of his adventures and of the evil deeds of the false priest with whom he had contended what tales he had told to-day not of miracles wrought by sacred relics nor of courts and councils and splendid cathedrals though he knew much of these things and had been at rome and received the pope's blessing but to-day he had spoke of long journeys by the sea and land of perils by fire and flood of wolves and bears and fierce snowstorms and black nights in the lonely forest of the dark altars 
of heaven gods and weird bloody sacrifices and narrow escapes from wandering savages the little novices had gathered around him and their faces had grown pale and their eyes bright as they listened with parted lips entranced in admiration twining their arms about one another's shoulders and holding closely together half in fear half in delight the older nuns had turned from their task and paused in passing by to hear the pilgrim story too well they knew the truth of what he spoke many a one among them had seen the smoke rising from the ruins of her father's roof many a one had a brother far away in the wild country to whom her heart went out day and night wondering if he were still among the living but now the excitements of that wonderful day were over the hours of the evening meal had come the inmates of the cloister were assembled in the refractory on the dais sat the stately abbess adula daughter of king dagobert looking a princess indeed in her violet tunic with the hood and cuffs of her long white robe trimmed with fur and the snowy veil resting like a crown on her snowy hair at her right hand was the honored guest and at her left hand her grandson the young prince gregor a big manly boy just returned from school the long shadowy hall with its dark brown ratters and beams the double rolls of nuns and their pure veils and fair faces the ruddy flow of the slanting sunbeams striking upward through the tops of the windows and painting a pink glow high up on the walls it was all as beautiful as a picture and as silent for this was the rule of the cloister that at the table all should sit in stillness for a little while and then one should read aloud while the rest listened it is the turn of my grandson to read to-day said the abbess to winfred we shall see how much he has learned in school read gregor the place in the book is marked the tall lad rose from his seat and turned the pages of the manuscript it was a copy of jerome's version of the scriptures in latin and the marked place was in the letter of st paul to the ephesians the passage where he describes the preparation of the christian as the arming of a warrior for glorious battle the young voice rang out clearly rolling the sonorous words without slipping or stumbling to the end of the chapter winfred listened smiling my son he said as the reader paused that was bravely read understandest thou what thou readest surely father answered the boy it was taught me by the masters at treviz and we have read this epistle clear through from beginning to end so that i almost know it by heart then he began to repeat the passage turning away from the page as if to show his skill but winford stopped him with a friendly lifting of the hand no so my son that is not my meaning when we pray we speak to god when we read it is god who speaks to us i ask whether thou hast heard what he has said to thee in thine own words in the common speech come give us again the message of the warrior and his armor and his battle in the mother tongue so that all can understand it the boy hesitated blushed stammered then he came around to winford's seat bringing the book take the book my father he cried and read it for me i cannot see the meaning plain though i love the sound of the words religion i know and the doctrines of our faith and the life of priests and nuns in the cloister for which my grandmother designs me though it likes me little the fighting i know and the life of warriors and heroes for i have read it in the virgil and the ancients and heard a bit from the soldiers at treviz and i would fain taste more of it for it likes me much but how the two lives fit together or what need there is of armor for a clerk in holy orders i can never see tell me the meaning for if there is a man in all the world that knows it i am sure it is none other than thou so winford took the book and closed it clasping the boy's hand with his own let us first dismiss the others to their vespers he said lest they should be weary 
a sign from the abbess, a chanted benediction, a murmur of sweet voices, and a soft rustling of many feet over the rushes on the floor, that the gentle tide of noise flowed through the doors and ebbed away down the corridors. The three at the head of the table were left alone in the darkening room. Then Winifred began to translate the parable of the soldiers into the realities of life. At every turn he knew how to flash a new light into the picture out of his own experience. He spoke of the combat with self and of the wrestling with the dark spirits in solitude. He spoke of the demons that men had worshipped for centuries in the wilderness and whose malice they invoked against the stranger who ventured into the gloomy forest gods they called them and told of strange tales of their dwelling among the impenetrable branches of the oldest trees and in the caverns of the shaggy hills of their riding on their wind horses and hurling spears of lightning against their foes gods they were not but foul spirits of the air rulers of the darkness was there not glory and honor in fighting with them in daring their anger under the shield of faith in putting them to flight with the sword of truth what better adventure could a brave man ask than to go forth against them and wrestle with them and conquer them look you my friend said winfred how sweet and peaceful is this convent to-night on the eve of the nativity of the prince of peace it is a garden full of flowers in the heart of winter a nest among the branches of a great tree shaken by the winds, a still haven on the edge of a tempestuous sea. And this is what religion means for those who are chosen and called to quietude in prayer and meditation. But out yonder in the wild forest, who knows what storms are raving tonight in the hearts of men? Though all the woods are still, who knows what haunts of wrath and cruelty and fear are closed to-night against the advent of the prince of peace and shall i tell you of what religion means to those who are called and chosen to dare and to fight and to conquer the world for christ it means to launch out into the deep it means to go against the strongholds of the adversary it means to struggle to win an entrance for the master everywhere what helmet is strong enough for this strife save the helmet of salvation what breastplate can guard a man against these fiery darts but the breastplate of righteousness what shoes can stand the wear of these journeys but the preparation of the gospel of peace shoes he cried again and laughed as if a sudden thought had struck him he thrust out his foot covered with a heavy cowhide boot laced high about his legs with thong of skin see here how a fighting man of the cross is shod i have seen the boots of the bishop of tours white kid embroidered with silk a day in the bogs would tear them to shreds i have seen the sandals that the monks use on the high roads yes and worn them ten pair of them have i worn out and thrown away in a single journey now i shoe my feet with the toughest hides hard as iron no rock can cut them no branches can tear them yet more than one pair of these have i worn out and many more shall i outwear ere my journeys are ended and i think if god is gracious to me that i shall die wearing them better so than in a soft bed with silken coverings the boots of a warrior a hunter a woodsman's these are my preparation of the gospel of peace come gregor he said lying his brown head on the youth's shoulder come wear the forester's boots with me this is the life with which we are called be strong in the lord a hunter of demons a subduer of the wilderness a woodsman of the faith come the boy's eyes sparkled he turned to his grandmother she shook her head vigorously nay father she said draw not the lad away from my side with these wild words i need him to help me with my labors to cheer my old age do you need him more than the master does asked winfred and will you take the wood that is fit for a bow to make a distaff but i fear for the child thy life is too hard for him he will perish with hunger in the woods once said winfred smiling we were camped by the bank of the river oru the table was spread for our morning meal but my comrades cried 
that it was empty the provisions were exhausted we must go without breakfast and perhaps starve before we could escape from the wilderness while they complained a fish-hawk flew up from the river with flapping wings and let fall a great pike in the midst of the camp there was food enough and to spare never have i seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread but the fierce pagans of the forest cried the abbess they may pierce the boy with arrows or dash out his brains with their axes he is but a child too young for the dangers of strife a child in years replied winfred but a man in spirit and if the hero must fall early in the battle he wears the brighter crown not a leaf withered not a flower fallen the aged princess trembled a little she drew gregor close to her side and laid her hand gently on his brown hair i am not sure he wants to leave me yet besides there is no horse in the stable to give him now and he cannot go as befits the grandson of a king gregor looked straight into her eyes grandmother he said dear grandmother if thou wilt not give me a horse to ride with this man of god i will go with him afoot End of chapter one Recording by Penny Ann